Good evening, um, friends, um, or, you know, good day, whatever time of day it is for you. Um, welcome to our panel discussion today on a very recent uh, new book um, by um, my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Sudhir Chella Rajan. Um, the book is titled A Social Theory of Corruption, uh, Notes from the Indian Subcontinent. Um, and it's published by Harvard University Press. Um, this book is uh, an attempt to think about uh, the long uh, history of corruption from, um, from um, you know, from ancient times in, in, uh, in, in South Asia on the subcontinent. Um, and in order to be able to do this, uh, it, it, um, it takes very interesting uh, philosophical risks, I would say, um, and also tries to uh, approach the question, um, not primarily historically, actually, but uh, in terms of uh, looking at human societies, human behavior, um, uh, uh, you know, social theory, very, very broadly conceived, uh, and then uh, trying to locate that uh, uh, within uh, specific uh, historical contexts in the history of the subcontinent. Um, Professor Chela Rajan is uh, uh, at the IIT Madras, uh, and he um, uh, does a variety of different things, uh, mostly at the intersection of political theory and environmental policy. Um, and um, this is his, his, his first book, which is a sort of uh, um, sort of openly uh, philosophical in its uh, in its uh, in its tone and tenor. Um, Professor Rajan is actually um, on his way to join this uh, this this uh, this uh, uh, event, um, and so uh, we may start by actually um, sort of uh, um, uh, playing a recording that he has sent us uh, of his uh, slideshow. And then, um, and then he'll join in, and then we can proceed from there. In discussion uh, today with um, uh, with Professor Rajan is um, uh, Professor Manu V. Devadevan, who is at the IIT in Mandi. Um, he's a historian, um, a, a philologist, a, a translator, um, and um, uh, I have a, a recent book of his here with me, uh, which is uh, the early medieval origins of India. Uh, but he's authored many, many books in many different languages. Um, and he's also the winner of the Infosys Prize for the Humanities um, um, not very long ago, in 2019, I think. Um, so Manu is joining us from IIT Mandi. Chela will join us from IIT Madras. Uh, we are sitting at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies here in New Delhi. Um, and if you'll um, uh, give us a second, we'll just um, uh, start off our proceedings. Thank you. Manu is in? You said, oh, he, oh okay. Chela says he's almost here. So, okay, why don't you do that? Why don't you start the, start, start his presentation and then he'll join, okay? Thank you very much, Ananya and Praveen, for this kind invitation. What I'm going to talk about today is primarily based on arguments from my book, The Social Theory of Corruption. But a book like that is a finished text that I can't summarize or replicate in a brief talk. So what I'll try to do here, rather, is to respond to some prior comments that have been uh, made by the half dozen or so persons who've read the book and to try to provide some context for the evident uh, eccentricity of the book in the broader world of uh, uh, historical and social science research. The question that has intrigued me was originally framed by Machiavelli. What are the usual ways in which claims for the maintenance of social order get expressed in the languages of moral order? Why is the spatial category of territory 
and its associated modes of protection, extraction, and war-making, Charles Tilley's formulation, such a crucial term in this enterprise. And finally, if we accept that consent and coercion have been vital for the long-term legitimacy and effectiveness of territorial polities, what does that tell us about cultural politics? None of this, of course, is novel, except perhaps for my use of the word corruption, and here too I owe a lot to Machiavelli. Next slide. Let me try and provide a broad philosophical defense for the project first. I take speculative realist ontology as my point of entry, and I make the following assumptions about social and material phenomena. I assume that there are underlying biochemical and interactive processes that make up socio-technical systems, which are in turn governed by dynamical feedback elements. But the latter are not reducible to the former. Society does not in any strong sense derive uh, from materially embedded processes, just as the latter in turn are not strictly causal. Rather, most socio-technical phenomena are best described as emergent, entangled, non-determined effects that we typically experience as human interaction, our ways of living, in socially and materially describable conditions of life. I try to stay with this image throughout my argument and draw sustenance principally from Norbert Elias's concept of uh, figuration, which he beautifully articulates in his many books, but especially in court society. I think Elias is useful for many reasons, but I mainly like the English clarity with which he communicates complex German sociological ideas. He describes social and material processes as human and natural performances in a fixed spatial and temp temporal relationship to one another. Hence, there are rules, discourses and bodily practices, like in a football game or chess, which require subjectively staged performances that shape themselves into the codes of that society or game. In so doing, his metaphors capture hierarchy, domination, and cultural and economic production, reproduction in very persuasive ways that overlap nicely with the ideas of assemblage theory, actor network theory, as well as uh, third, the, the, you know, theories of people like Gramsci, Zizek, and Sloterdijk. Slide three. A pragmatist realist ontology would then try to craft these admittedly speculative redescriptions while being careful to avoid naive representations or ones that reinforce discursive strategies of dominant modes of power. The recent discovery of the Anthropocene has shaken up the humanities and social sciences community in ways that would strike most natural scientists as both funny and puerile. If you don't believe me, go to Google Scholar and just type Anthropocene. I think this has to do with the confusion spawned by a misreading of Kant and the influence of Wittgenstein and Heidegger in different ways. In the 20th century, scholars in the humanities and social sciences became increasingly convinced that whereas zones of human practice were interpretive and filtered through meanings construed by the symbolic and discursive order, the natural world was mostly autonomous from human entanglements or at least only vaguely connected with them. The problem is that the social construction of ideas about physical laws, which most scientists would accept, was understood to mean that the phenomena they represented had no nominal or actual basis behind them. Philosophy may not be a mirror of reality, but many natural science theories have a pretty good characterization of many real processes. Thomas Kuhn's point, of course, is that there are often distinct descriptions in these theories that may use logics and language that are incompatible across the paradigms. So planetary crises such as the pandemic and climate change have revealed multiple social natural entanglements that have complicated the neat division between the social and natural sciences. For the former, it has raised questions about what is meant by a materially embedded reality. It has also forced social science methodology to engage in practices that sustain a concept of the independent reality of being, not to be confused with the independent or universal theories, vis-a-vis -vis the relativity of all forms of know knowing and knowledge. Just because there are different forms of knowing doesn't mean that there is no connection between the epistemes 
and socio-technical processes and events. So society and its routines uh, can be seen to emerge from human interaction within a given material context and history, but such interaction is not arbitrary or random, but contingent. That is to say, it is put together by active agents and materials within that milieu. The interaction has pattern and repeatability, which can be seen as having rough edges across history. It frequently manifests itself in mobilizations of large populations in the name of some collective causes that are associated with the generation and fortification of ordered routines. Socio-material assemblages across various spatial realms and with different degrees of complexity seem to drive much of the coherent action and processes around us. So slide four. A second clarificatory point that I want to make is that describing power requires both careful micro histories and epoch changing transformations, as well as an acknowledgement of multi scale interactions as sometimes having specific logics and outcomes. To the extent that several of these are repetitive, we can generate theory again at multiple scales. For instance, in our Anthropocene age, if you look only at the last 10,000 years, it turns out that a very tiny fraction of humanity has, quote unquote, created history. But those histories are associated with planetary scale social forces. And therefore, incidentally, discounting the now famous Graeber Wengrow thesis, which claims that the inexorable tr draw of territorial power may have been overplayed in our understanding of human past since the Chakolithic age. In contrast, I think the evidence is just too clear that not necessarily the forces of history, perhaps, but certainly the success of certain strategies of territorial control through extraction and protection, that was too rewarding to the elite networks which control them. And you can call them cabals. But and it was so, so convincing that many groups wanted to repeat this strategy across contexts. And this extended all the way to our own age of constitutional republics. And here I, I, I want to refer to the wonderful two volume Oxford World History of Empire, edited by Peter Bang, uh, Chris Bailey and Walter Scheidel. The important cultural outcomes of such strategies is really what should interest us from a normative stance, for it implicates our own ways of living, the levels of betrayal to humanity that we are each every day willing to subject our practices to. But of course, each has its own discursive formation and ideology, if you like. Take, for example, the willingness to die in combat for a territorial cause. This meant that somehow cabals created conditions for rallying together a remarkable commitment to this cause, no matter how weak at times there was any kind of justification for it. What should interest us most of all is that most histories of rebellion are absent in annals and archives. So we don't, we don't actually hear about you know, resistance to these kinds of uh, territorial strategies. Slide five. Third, I emphasize that I eschew any teleological reading of the past that makes claims about the direction or inevitability of events, even though I will admit to the possibility of misreadings of my argument in this historicist sense. I do find compelling a cultural reading of how cabal structures can reproduce themselves in specific territorial landscapes. The Egyptian empire being the most enduring and clearest in identifying elite networks of power. And here I also want to flag my uh, debt to Monica Smith's idea of corridor forms of territorial power, network power forms of uh, uh, territorial power in early complex polities. I also want to sort of state this course full of complaints that I have about historians and other social scientists who blithely use the term state when the word is actually a 19th century construction referring to a very particular constellation of modes of territorial power, administration and border control. So it's one, th one thing to concede that every age should be viewed as having its own vocabulary and value and set of values, but quite another to say that these are not connected to social practice and discourse acro across the ages. So uh, I find it odd that uh, uh, social scientists would, would persist in using the term state, but would have problems using 
other categories across times. So, so that's just a, 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 a footnote complaint. So slide six. Now that I've gotten all this epistemological baggage out of the way, let me get to the question of corruption. In policy discourse, corruption is defined as the abuse of public office for private gain. But in a long tradition of scholars from Joseph Nye and Samuel Huntington uh, to Peter Eubin, Michael Johnston, Daniel Kaufman, Mark Philp, Akhil Gupta and Olivier de Sadron, I find the public-private definitions of corruptions here conceptually frail. This becomes clear, especially when we look at the etymology of the word corruption. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, corruption originates in the obsolete English corrump, to decompose or rot, the Latin corrumpere, to adulterate, false, falsify, violate, bribe. In a similar vein, the Hindi and Sanskrit word is brashtachar, which is a combination of brasht, or degenerate and rotten, and archer, custom, practice, code, or institution. It is a stink of decay in the putrid sense of fubai in Chinese, or ural in Tamil, the slow attrition of basic human decency. It connotes venality, selling offices, being mercenary, or otherwise forsaking principles, which, when held jointly, would denote solidarity and sensible community life. It is disgraceful because it implicates a sizable number of people acting in collusion who would betray such ideals. But it is additionally wretched because it causes entire ways of living to lose trust as familiar actions and institutions eventually come under suspicion. So let me begin with a general question. Do human societies recurrently organize themselves to accommodate elite interests? If so, how must we read social structure and the wheels of power that seem to animate it? So if you take a look at these headlines, uh, they're all different, uh, but they all have this family resemblance to what we understand as corruption and uh, the, the abuse of public uh, office for private gain simply doesn't cut it. So these are all surely different modalities of corruption. And how do we characterize them in a single frame? I'll come back. I'll try to come back to that. But first answer the question above to paraphrase. Can we relate the operations of domination with patterns of everyday life? And is there deception involved when these patterns settle down for the long haul? And of course, there are eminent traditions in the social sciences that draw connections between forms of domination and cultural practices. But can we redescribe these relationships in terms of extensive networks of brokers and agents extending from putative sovereign territorial authority but definitely having very clear, concentrated nodes of wealth. That is the broad attempt in my book. So corruption is felt viscerally as a betrayal of trust. We lose faith in formal institutions, governments and other large systems that bring about social order. But we're mostly betrayed by the informal ones, when our ways of living become suspect, when what we cherish most is implicated in how it fattens certain uh, elite interests at the expense of many, including ourselves. Slide 7. Between 2600 and 1900 BCE in northwestern India, Pakistan and parts of the Swat Valley in Afghanistan, there flourished more than 1000 cities of varying sizes that were strikingly similar in form and artifacts across half a million square miles. This is all very familiar to everybody in the audience. These network cities displayed multiple scales and activities of ancient industrialization, the production of shell and stone-based jewelry, technologies of construction, water engineering, trade and shipping, and urban planning. These were organized into similarly aligned routines in multiple sites across an enormous area, even while they had local variations. At least a few hundred thousand people in each generation acted or enacted rather the spatial rhythms of Harappan economy, including the maintenance of cities and its material flows. What was the nature of authority that operated in Harappa? I, uh, I don't agree with uh, some scholars uh, who would say there was no authority because that's 
There's clearly evidence for it. Probably operated on two registers that complemented each other. The first was that through some as yet unknown set of rituals involving water and perhaps fire too, based on a very limited number of altars that were found. Harappan rituals constituted a highly regulated set of practices guided by the author authorizing voice of moral, innate, eternal, and inescapable power. The second were the well-adapted routines of everyday life, especially the production of standardized objects, the pattern pa patterns, sorry, the pattern structures of well-ordered cities, and perhaps the exemplar simplicity of the priestly class. Cities are, after all, sites of accumulation, and they generate organizational forces of their own through processes of cynicism and act as important nodal centers for building corridors of network power. In many periods and across geographical contexts, merchants, priests, entrepreneurs, and financiers have made up interlocking elites in cities and are also connected complexly across distance, but with important bridging partners and associated rents. For over 700 years, small but increasingly powerful groups of traders may have made strategic moves to initiate systematic forms of urban planning, means to organize labor for industrial scale production of items of trade that were presumably dominated by gemstones, beads and necklaces, but also potentially goods that have long since perished, including crops such as indigo and turmeric, textiles, rosewood and furniture and various forms of influence over forms of worship. Together, they may, this may have ended up creating fetishized or ritual patterns that serve to congeal into social structures, including kinship rules, primogeniture, forms of capital, and relations of production and exchange, and very possibly conditions to establish sovereign rights, sacred places, and so on. These practices would have comprised an ideology of ceremonial complexes that reinforced elite authority. Proximity promotes the formation of dense differentiated populations, with the most successful ones being ones being those that are extensively connected with the outside. In the case of Harappa, elite seal bearers might have been the agents of transaction with Mesopotamia. Trade in beads may have been a singular route for generating economic surplus. But this was likely accompanied by a further differentiation of roles and control that continued to remain an archaeological enigma. I would like to end with these two last slides. James Gladfelder has been exploring different webs of social networks, particularly those at the highest echelons of financial power. The largest connected component makes up the bulk of the economic value. He calls it a kind of a bow type structure. Furthermore, core economic power structures, he says, are remarkably robust to shocks and that power remains extremely concentrated in the hands of a few individuals and organizations. Actors within the inner core have remarkably well aligned interests around issues such as climate inaction, corporate tax avoidance, anti-competitiveness, and so on. My conjecture, therefore, is that there are related morphologies of such elite networks at different scales and at different periods that have resulted in high centrality, many holes, and other familiar forms or syndromes that serve to concentrate wealth and power in small groups. Elite networks are always in the making but they also always form interlocking meshes with other types of social networks. Network formation, my freshman class has informed me, arises from a human, or if you want to call it biopsychological impulse, to engage in creative spirits. Perhaps private enterprise is one such form, but it depends essentially on, on a guild of support, as well as structured finance to protect it from marauders and such. Hence, you have end up with what Charles Tilly has also called a laddered structure of protectors and facilitators and so on. I'm poorly skilled uh, to speculate further here. Last slide. And this is, th th these are images from the climate movement and I'm going to simply uh, uh, quote um, Greta Thunberg, quote, 
they invite cherry picked young people to meetings like this to pretend that they listen to us but they clearly don't listen to us our emissions are still rising the science doesn't lie we can no longer let the people in power decide what is politically possible we can no longer let the people in power decide what hope is hope is not passive hope is not blah 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 hope is telling the truth hope is telling taking action and hope always comes from the people thank you thank you thank you so much uh, chella and i see you've joined us um, so if you'd like to come in and maybe say a bit more before we move to manu uh, that would be great or if you want to go over your slide show or something i don't know whatever you like thanks thanks so much ananya and i'm so sorry for all this drama uh, i uh, hadn't uh, intended to kind of send you a recording and i had to kind of do this in a flash <laughs> in a hospital waiting room so Uh, and thanks for accommodating all this uh, as well uh, i don't i i think i'll just wait for manu to speak and then i i can you know uh, get into the discussion afterwards manu are you there are you able to put on your camera manu actually manu is also having um internet issues chella there's no electricity Um, yeah, on technology. Huh? <laughs> I, I I see that he's on, but I can't. I, I but he's on the sideways for something. Sideways. Are you able to hear us and speak, Manu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm able to hear. Your vol, your yeah. You know what? You're you're sideways, like you're. I'm sorry. You are here, and the camera is here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you possibly change the orientation of your camera? Kind of property for the little room. Is there anything that I can do? Okay, all right. But you are able to do it. Chella knows me very well, so maybe it's better. It, listen, this is yeah. very distracting. Maybe you can just turn your camera off and and speak. Oh, I see. Can you not rotate it somehow? I don't know. Oh gosh. Okay, that's fine. Can you please speak very loud, Manu? Because we can barely hear you. How is it now? Huh? You can hear me now. Well, kind of. Okay, please start. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ananya and uh, uh, Praveen, for organizing this uh, uh, book discussion. I'm glad to see you, Professor Sudhir Chellar, as well here, in spite of the uh, the injury. I I read Chellar's book in the second week of uh, January. It was the second book that I read in this year. Uh, the first one was, of course, a, a thousand-page study on the Mahabharata in, in Malayalam, and then I picked up a, a social theory of corruption. There were three reasons for uh, reading the book. Uh, today's event was, of course, one of them. Uh, the second reason, uh, uh, I'm afraid, is confidential. Uh, all that I can disclose now is that uh, uh, the book is under consideration for an award, and I read the book as a member of the jury. The uh, third reason was because of, of my own interest in the world of crime in the city in which I grew up, which is uh, Bangalore. So there were small pockets of crime that existed in the city from the early 20th century, uh, possibly even earlier. So these centered on the traditional uh, gymnasiums that you know we call it garadi. So these were training centers for uh, wrestlers. Now, from the last years of the 1960s, okay, these pockets began to be consolidated in certain ways. This was done by politicians and uh, businessmen to target trade union strikes and uh, to break up the incipient student union movement uh, that was uh, that was emerging at the time to break it up into a number of Uh, rival faction. So that's that's what I wanted to examine. Um, I don't know what I'll write. Perhaps a quickly footnoted monograph, or perhaps a popular account, maybe a, a memoir, perhaps even a novel. So this is the third reason for uh, for reading that Chella's book. It's a very easy book to read, uh, a lucid piece of writing, powerful prose, I must say. Uh, in fact, I began reading it in the morning one day, uh, soon after breakfast. Uh, say something around sometime around uh, 8 a.m. and by about 11 p.m. I had finished the book, uh, and then it was fun. Uh, I went to bed, 
I had a dream. Uh, I saw a well-dressed uh, gentleman with the bourgeois looks, tall, lean, gray hair, neatly combed, clean shaven, uh, bright eyes. He tells me, uh, Manu, you know what? You are bloody corrupt, damn it. I, I try to reason with him. I tell him, sir, I am not. I have never accepted bribe and I have never ever bribed anyone in life. And he says, see, that's the old theory of corruption. I now have a new theory and uh, my new theory tells that you are corrupt ex officio because you are an IIT professor. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I'm not going to speak something that is very, very deep or intellectually stimulating. Uh, I have some elementary reflections to make. Uh, Chella argues, uh, this is in the book, not in the dream, uh, that the, uh, the definition of corruption that we are working with, uh, we are working with today, uh, is a kind of managerial view of corruption. Uh, it is about the abuse of uh, public office for private gain, which he just mentioned in the talk as well. And he shows us uh, how the representation of corruption that we have in classical antiquity, uh, Greece and Rome, or in Machiavelli, is much comprehensive uh, than this uh, narrow understanding. Uh, so the, the forest that we see in Machiavelli or in the writings from classical antiquity uh, are now mistaken for the uh, tree. Uh, the, the, the focus in our times is on individual acts of bribery rather than on the larger context where uh, there are entrenched networks uh, through which uh, corruption operates. Uh, he argues that there is uh, something systemic about uh, corruption and it is implicated in the networks of power. This, I believe, is a much nuanced uh, way of looking at corruption. I think, I think there is an emerging consensus among scholars that uh, this approach makes uh, better sense than the uh, managerial view of corruption. I have limited familiarity with this literature, but Chella has himself cited a few authorities, most notably uh, Michael Johnson, but also Akhil Gupta, uh, Veena Das, and others. Now, Chella's approach, his, uh, his luxury approach to the question such as corruption is, I think, absolutely refreshing. Um, I don't want to get into the historical details that he brings to the table. Some of them are conjectural. Uh, for instance, he posits that the Harappan civilization was governed by elites who created the certain forms of uh, normativity that he calls uh, an ecosystem, uh, not an ecosystem, he uses another word, yeah, habitus. He calls it a habitus of asceticism. Uh, it's, a, it's a creative way of looking at it. Um, I'm a poet, uh, poetry is my first love, and the poet in me is all the way with Chella here. Uh, but the practicing historian in me says, wait, this might be true, but we don't really know. And then the discussion on the Vedic period and the fairly long period that he calls uh, Dharma Yuga, uh, I think they, they have the focus on uh, Northern India. Uh, there are a number of interesting things that Chella says in these two chapters, and uh, he also says a couple of things that are perhaps dated, but this book is not addressed to the practicing historian. So I'll not, uh, I'll not get into them, I'll leave them aside. The lesson that I learned from the book is this. Corruption, as we now understand it, is about breaking rules. There are rules, there are norms, there are procedures, and they are meant to be followed. One becomes corrupt when one breaks the rules. Chela simply turns the whole thing upside down. He says that you are corrupt because you make rules. You get that? You're corrupt because you make rules. That, I believe, is the cream of the book. And that's the definition that I'll endorse any uh, Now, I want to share some thoughts on two uh, interesting histories from South India. Uh, these histories are from the 9th to the uh, 12th century. I'm speaking about the South because Chela has mostly written about uh, uh, the northern part of the subcontinent. And the period that I've chosen is also different from the period that uh, he is. Uh, the first region is uh, uh, Kerala. There was a military system in, in Kerala in the uh, Chera period. So that is roughly between the mid 9th century and the early uh, 12th century. Uh, this was called the hundreds organization. So we come across things such as 300, you know, Munnutuva, there is 500, the Ainutuva, the 600, the Aranutuva, and so on. And of course, you have the uh, biggest of them, Aida. Which is 3000. Now, Munutua refers to an individual who is in charge of a militia with 300 soldiers. And Arunutua has 600 soldiers with him and so on. Now, this security arrangement was part of the apparatus of power. 
it was an essential component of power and one can actually trace the idea back to the arthashastra about which Kela has written uh, fairly extensively but this is not all it was an essential component of the agrarian life an essential component of the agrarian economy it was not simply a body of soldiers fighting war after war with outsiders that is with the uh, other states or with insiders that is with the uh, recalcitrant parliament so their presence in the towns and the countryside their presence in the temple uh, their presence in the royal land holdings uh, their presence in the in the palace itself was simply ubiquitous um, they had several offices to minister actually providing security uh, collecting revenue managing the money belonging to the temple so this militia uh, becomes a crucial factor in the history of Kerala in subsequent times. So the uh, Chera power disintegrates in the early 12th century, and after that there is no uh, unified kind of state in Kerala for several centuries. All we have are little principalities and estates uh, scattered uh, throughout the region. But the agrarian elites and the warlords promote this militia. Uh, this is not all about the body of hundreds alone. We have uh, several others. We have, for instance, uh, functionaries entrusted with security, uh, uh, an official called in pardon. There is uh, Nijal, which is a local body of troops. So we are we hear of something called the Nijal Irikkal. Uh, historians who wrote the, before the 1970s thought that the uh, Nijal Irikkal was sitting in the chain, which is what it literally means. Uh, but a uh, historian, a prominent historian from Kerala, S.G.S. Narayana, uh, showed that middle was a fourth shade, but shade of a different kind. It referred to the shade or, uh, or protection provided by the militia. It refers to the, uh, the Agambari shade. So the Chera inscriptions also refer very often, very often to Raksha, to Kaval, and so on. So what we have here is a political structure deeply rooted in an agrarian economy where men, uh, men who are authorized to carry weapons, uh, are just about everywhere. Now, this was in itself uh, quite scary, and uh, that's when, as if this wasn't enough, one of MGS's uh, MA students, Keshavan Vilkar, uh, goes to JNU for his MPhil. He was fascinated by MGS's ideas concerning the militia. Now, sitting in JNU in the mid 1970s, he was, I believe, uh, venting out his anger against uh, Indira Gandhi's police network during the emergency uh, by writing a paper that was scarier than what uh, MGS had written. Uh, this paper that actually has turned out to be one of the most iconic pieces uh, in Indian history. It's called uh, Chattas and Bhattas. Inscriptions from the 5th, 6th century onwards speak about the Chattas and Bhattas, and they shed some sidelights that help us to learn, uh, learn of their uh, military uh, character. Uh, in fact, uh, there's an aside. Uh, Keshavan was in the habit of uh, getting into an argument, you know, arguing with everyone when he disagreed with the views that they had expressed. Uh, he did not quite care who he was arguing with. And he uh, he argued very frequently with the two of his teachers in Jain, uh, Brajadulal Chattopadhyay and Sabya Sati Bhattacharya. So the joke during the rounds in JNU was that uh, Chatta and Bhatta actually meant Chattopadhyay and Bhattacharya. Uh, now, in this paper, uh, Keshavan actually showed that the system of schooling uh, that was prevalent uh, between the 7th and the 12th century was mostly tilted towards military training. So if a boy went to a school, a school such as Kandalur Sala, for instance, to learn grammar or mathematics, it was uh, not unlikely that uh, he came back as an expert on grammar or mathematics. But even if he had not learned these disciplines, uh, he would certainly have learned the art of knocking up a few heads with the school, because that was part of the curriculum and that was the core of the curriculum. So we get this impression from uh, Keshavan's description of Kandalu Chale. Uh, now, uh, the paper also showed that this was not something that was unique to Kerala. We do have similar institutions in other parts of uh, India as well. Now, I'll come to the second uh, second uh, instance. This is from Karnataka. Uh, this is the time when we come across a large number of uh, Shaiva saints uh, who, are, who call themselves uh, Jadana. Uh, they are now thought to be the founders of the uh, Indian of that is the Lingayat state. Uh, you had people such as uh, Basava, Allama Prabhu, Akka Mahadevi, Channa Basava, Madiwala Mataya, Neelamma, literally hundreds of them. Many of them, in fact, composed the poems called Vachanas. I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Vachana translations of uh, H.S. Shiva Prakash and A.K. Ramanujan. Uh, the poems of about 130 uh, saints have survived. 
So some of them uh, uh, came from the Kala Mukha sect, some of them came from the Pashupata, but the greater majority of these Sadhis, the Sharanas, uh, were Maheshwara. They, they were called Veera Maheshwara. So the Maheshwara uh, are known to know by a few other names. They, they are called Shuddha Shaiva, they are called Shrotriya, sometimes simply Shaiva. Uh, when, when we come across the word Shaiva in 12th or 13th or 14th century South India, it actually refers to the Maheshwara, not to the Kalamuka or Pashupata or the other side. Now, this sect emerged in Madhya Pradesh, uh, where they maintain warm relations with the Kalachuri power. Uh, there they were called Siddhanta Shaivas or the Siddhanti, uh, and they were they were widespread uh, throughout Madhya Pradesh and the adjoining areas of Uttar Pradesh, particularly the area centering on Gwalior. Now, within this sect, uh, there were a number of branches or monastic lineages. Now, one of them uh, is the lineage called Matta Mayura. Now, this is the lineage that comes to South India, where the Choras and the Kakatiyas uh, extend and their uh, support. Now, this group, the Maheshwaras and their predecessors in Madhya Pradesh, the Siddhanta Shaivas, were monks, they were priests, they were philosophers, they helped the state in collecting revenue, they maintained law and order, and they fought wars. Because the Maheshwaras were also war history, uh, who had their military training and uh, who sent their troops to the king when the king, uh, king wanted to wage a war against another power. So the element of valor, the military element, became a part of the Sharana ethos as well. Although it is uh, thought to be a bhakti movement, uh, there is less of bhakti and more of militia at this particular moment. Uh, and they called themselves Veera Maheshwaras. And because uh, Shaiva was a synonym for Ma uh, Maheshwara, they are called Veera Shaiva. So in fact, uh, in the story of Basava, uh, we are told of a regicide. Uh, his followers are said to have killed the king uh, Bigdala. Um, the fact of the matter is that Vijaya was killed by his rival, Someshwara Kenshna, a warlord called Jagadeva. The Veera Shaiva legends cleverly appropriate him uh, as a, a Sharana. Now, there were soldiers among the Sharana as well. People such as Shiva Lenka Manchana, for instance. And Basava was in the service of the state. Uh, he was in charge of the treasury. He was called a Bhandari. But in the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th century, a functionary of the state was generally a person in charge of a band of troops as well. Mostly warlords, but sometimes brahmanas, sometimes merchants, artisans, they also had that body of troops. So in all likelihood, Basava also had a band of troops under his control. Because he is called a Bhandari at times, but he is mostly addressed as Dandanayaka or Dandanayaka. And his nephew, uh, Chenna Basava, is called Chitka Dandanayaka, that is the little Dandanayaka. Now, uh, tell us thesis. Uh, revolves around the idea of elite consolidation uh, or the, the long duration process of the formation of our uh, elite. Uh, I would personally not prefer to limit corruption to this process alone. Uh, the length of inclusion and exclusion that Taylor uh, writes about, I believe, will start a little more dimension. Now, what I want to add to this thesis, uh, to the thesis that Taylor uh, has advanced in this, uh, that before the advent of the rule of law, uh, human collectives that arose, uh, both, both elite and uh, non elite, but, uh, non -elite had a body of retainers attached, and it was through actual physical violence uh, that inclusion and exclusion were enforced. Uh, in fact, uh, there are a number of places in his book where he has spoken about uh, violence, but I think uh, one can dwell upon that uh, some more length because it's a very, very uh, ubiquitous kind of thing that we uh, know, at least up to the end of the uh, 13th and uh, 14th century. In fact, even after that, although I have not examined that at some length. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Camera on me, please. I mean, not mute me, unmute me. Yeah. Can you just move the... Thank you. Thanks a lot, Manu. Um, I think it's a miracle that we've uh, all three managed to have some sort of connection and conversation. Um, I just wanted to, uh, and I was hoping, in fact, Manu, that you would uh, talk about South India that you know so well and that you would bring in uh, peninsular and Deccan um, and Southern polities uh, of the pre-modern period. So thank you for doing that. Um, the ongoing uh, uh, historical education of, of, uh, of uh, Professor Rajan. 
Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Chella, I just, you know, I just had very um, sort of uh, general remarks and they're more in the nature of uh, questions for you so that maybe you can uh, say a bit more uh, once we get going, um, you know, with our discussion. Um, as I see it, you posit corruption as a sort of universal. Is that correct? Um, in the sense that something like corruption you detect or you see in different societies at different points in history, different places in the world, and in different political and social settings and configurations uh, of power and of human dwelling, right? Now, this in itself is a pretty audacious sort of a attempt, I would say, at least, I mean, it, 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 it took me quite a while to, um, to accept that this is, you know, a feasible project at all. Um, and I say that in all seriousness, I mean, I, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't, you know, mean to dismiss it or make fun of it or anything. But as you, as you said, you know, in your, in your um, presentation, um, if we can blithely talk about something like the state, um, you know, for all of pre-modernity, when strictly speaking, the state is a very modern form of, 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 of political, territorial, social, economic, etc., cetera, organization, um, then, you know, why not play fast and loose with other sorts of categories, including your um, chosen one, which is, which is corruption. And mm -hmm. I, was, uh, I was actually thinking of, you know, uh, uh, you know, as a historian categories that, that one is absolutely unembarrassed about using in a trans-historical sense, right? I mean, one can historicize them as and when needed, but then one also uses them trans-historically, which as you rightly pointed out, includes state, includes um, something like domination, sovereignty, power, rule of law, law itself, um, inequality, dissent, you know, these are all, if you really start thinking about these very basic building blocks of, you know, the, the social sciences and the humanities that all of us use in different ways in our particular disciplinary uh, orientations, um, you know, you, you could possibly start to question as you have done, um, whether it's valid to think of them as, um, you know, transcultural, uh, as pan-human, as trans-historical, as universal in some philosophical sense. Um, you know, how exactly, you know, how, how much can we break these categories down and still find that, that uh, we are able to talk sensibly uh, and comparatively across cultures, across societies and uh, across historical periods, right? So um, just as an example for, um, for our, you know, for, for your audience of people who haven't yet read your book, I would say, um, uh, you know, and you, 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 you showed the slide as well. You look at Harappan, the Harappan, the Indus Valley uh, civilization and the Harappan cultures, right? Now, it, it seemed to me, I was reading your chapter and I thought, how can we know if the Harappans were corrupt or not? no matter how carefully we define what we mean by corruption in this context, right? When we cannot even read their language, when we have absolutely no idea what that script means, um, at least we didn't until till the other day, I, and I'm not sure we still do. Um, it's such a barrier to understanding their social structure, their belief systems, their power dynamics, uh, you know, their, uh, their uh, urban life, uh, their political life, and so on, right? So, of course, you do what everyone else does, which is that you go to the archaeological remains, because that's all we have. Right, and you look at the layout of the of the of, of the cities, and you look at the grids, and you look at the you know water systems, and you look at um, you know the size of the of the dwellings, and you look at you know, and you make various deductions 
uh, uh, you know, you, you infer various things uh, based on the, the, the material evidence and the archaeological data and what has survived that we are able to read that is legible to us because those seals and so on are not legible to us, right, so far, or the script is not legible to us. It's still, I mean, it still bothered me that merely based on something like urban design or plumbing and sewage, right, how are we to understand whether there were elites or not, whether this was some kind of a proto-totalitarian state or not, whether, you know, these people had some form of equality or, uh, or inequality, right? How was power distributed? Can that be projected purely out of urban design, right? Uh, you know, at a distance of, of, of 4,000 years or 3,000 years or whatever it is. Um, and, and I, 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 I was not entirely convinced that you can read the presence or the absence of corruption in the sense of, um, you know, domination by some groups, uh, the presence of, let's say, an oligarchy or, or, or elite capture of some sort of resources, you know, uh, all of these things, I wondered, you know, what what was the missing link that that you know that you were able to see but i wasn't that allowed you to 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 characterize harappan society for you know to test it almost like you know like a covid test you know is 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 the virus there or not you know is is it was it corrupt or not um uh, you know what what is it in your reading of history or philosophy that allows you to make that sort of a claim right um, and I understand, I understand that actually you're trying to look at a number of categories which are also proper to their, uh, to their place and their time. For instance, when you're looking at the Vedic period, you know, you're looking very carefully at sacrifice, right? What does sacrifice, what does Vedic ritual actually uh, tell us about all sorts of things? Uh, 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 about normativity, about power, about, um, uh, you know, equality, about social organization, about caste and so on. Uh, what can we deduce from this one uh, motif of, of, of the Vedic culture and the Vedic literature, right? Uh, and is sacrifice something that then becomes uh, universalizable or does it have any transhistorical purchase, right? Similarly, you, you move on to dharma in the next uh, in the next chapter, right? Uh, which which you know we may or may not want to understand as as, as some kind of normative framework as law, etc. Um, you know, but can it be made to do work in some context that is far removed from uh, the historical context in which it is produced, right? Away, far away from the Buddha and Ashoka and 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 you know all, all of all of the first millennium uh, uh, cultures and civilizations of of the subcontinent, you know, can we still understand dharma as as something which you know is out there in the world, as you are trying to look at corruption, perhaps to some extent. I'm you know I'm speaking really as somebody who only understands. Uh, the pre-modern, uh, you know, and with, with with nowhere near sort of your your grasp of of, of these these other theories about network power and uh, you know certain kinds of behaviorism and 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 social theory and so on, um, which are very much tied to the modern state and the modern nation, um, uh, and 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 modern forms of of of, of political power. Um, so I. I would just push you a bit, you know, you, uh, on, you know, you said you had this complaint about the historicism of, 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 of others. And, and I have this question uh, about how you want to get out from under that, you know, and posit something like corruption um, in such a universal fashion, right? And do you actually have the data at your disposal uh, to make these sorts of claims about different kinds of societies? Um, I think you can claim that, you know, the pharaohs of Egypt were uh, tyrannical, right? You can, I mean, you can actually make that claim, you know, based on, 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 on the kinds of structures that they built, 
right based on their their pyramids and their mummies and so on you know you 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 would be in your in your in your rights to say something like that but can you uh you know can you say something in fact like the harappans had corruption um you know because that is because in in in, in you know both both items here are are less legible than let's say the 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 pharaonic period in in uh in uh, in uh, egypt right um um and uh, sorry lastly i just want to say that you know i i appreciated very much your your starting point for this inquiry i think which is um to try and break down um the the disciplinary boundary but also the the cognitive or the epistemological boundary i would say between you know nature and culture right between the planetary and the political right between um you know um the 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 biological and the social right and and in a sense we are being forced to do that in our own moment on account of phenomena like climate change or global warming or the pandemic and so on right where where nature is is very much in our faces and we are not protected within our social structures from uh you know larger natural events processes and and uh, transformations that uh, that uh, you know in which we are embedded and of which we are we are a part and and which we also create uh, to some extent and drive in certain directions so so i you know i i while i while i can see that in order to to have that kind of positioning vis-a-vis -vis, let's say very bluntly the biological and the social you know and to keep them within a common frame we would have to have more such inquiries right into categories that we think of as being primarily let's say uh social and not biological right uh political and not you know uh, uh natural and so on right but we have to begin to we have to begin to break those categories down and in that sense you know so far as you you you've started that you've started off that process with with corruption which is i mean the one that you've chosen you know i might have gone for inequality right because that's something that 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 is of 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 the greatest interest as far as i'm concerned um to any kind of long term description um you know of 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 human history uh, and of human life um i would i would have gone with that but you know um i just want to leave you with 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 you know my impressions as 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 a reader um who had some access to what you were doing but not not necessarily all of the access in terms of your own points of reference uh in in the social sciences and in um, you know environmental studies and other disciplines that you know so well so thank you so much ella thank you for this wonderful opportunity and thank you for bravely sitting there you know um straight out from the operation theater or whatever um so why don't you why don't you say a little bit and then we'll <clears throat> we'll go to our our uh, q and a and will uh you know ask others if they want to want to jump in well thank you so much uh, manu and uh, yeah for these you know overly generous remarks uh, first of all and uh, and also you know very thoughtful uh, interventions and let me let me actually uh, come to manu after i respond a little bit to ananya because this seems to be uh, a more common concern or question i've heard uh, you know often enough from my you know from the earliest reviewers of the manuscript um, you know through readers at this stage uh, this question around you know what kind of category is corruption uh, how can you sort of uh, uh, you know use a, a term that has contemporary valence and meaning and apply it across uh you know all sorts of contexts uh, does that is that even meaningful so i take uh, you know first of all let me say that i take uh, uh courage from people like peter yubin and a lot of classicists uh in in you know of ancient athens classical athens and classical rome uh and the word corruption there meant something quite uh, significant uh, uh 
uh, you know, across various contexts. And uh, uh, Peter Eupin has very beautifully written on, on this. Uh, so I have uh, Arlene Saxon House and various others. Uh, I think there's a, there's a Ramsey Macmillan has written a book called The Corruption of Rome. And uh, for those of you who read uh, uh, Aristotle, Aristotle is very concerned about the corruption of uh, different types of polity uh, <clears throat> and so on. So, so this word uh, seems to have some uh, salience uh, in, 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 the, in classical thought. And then it reappears in Machiavelli. In the, in the, in the Indian South Asian context and other contexts, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm hardly uh, capable of, of reading, uh, you know, uh, text translated into English, and, and, and I certainly don't have access to any other language. So I, I really can't say I haven't, I can't say that corruption was a term that had any kind of meaning or significance in um, ancient uh, uh, India or uh, early India or anywhere else. So, so this was also, you know, one of the one of the enigmas. How do you? I, 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 am I going to use this term uh, that probably had some sort of origins in uh, uh, Greek history, Greek and Roman history, very very significant, important uh, histories, and uh, you know, how could I sort of apply them to uh, to other contexts? So that, that that's so. Let me set that aside for a moment because. It also occurred to me that uh, as I was reading these texts on corruption, uh, uh, particularly uh, texts by contemporary writers who were fed up with uh, this managerial uh, definition of corruption, which, which bombards us daily. I mean, so when we today hear or, or, or think about corruption, we're thinking about very specific forms of behavior. We're thinking about, uh, you know, uh, disobeying the rule of law, certainly, but also, in a sense, cheating the system, getting wealthy, et cetera, et cetera. And then, and then when we kind of look around and we start to see uh, corruption in its many contemporary manifestations, I would think doubts start to sort of emerge. So when you start looking at what's going on with, uh, you know, cricket, with uh, the National Football League, uh, you look at, uh, uh, you know, the arts, uh, you see a whole series of other scandals, and the scandal itself isn't the issue, it's just the enormous resources that are available to cover them up, to sort of hide these things, and, and the participation of ordinary people in these uh, types of cover-up. I mean, the, the multiple, I mean, the, the deeper you look into some of these scandals, the worse the picture gets, and that's why, you know, instances like the uh, Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers, and, and uh, uh, you know a whole series of other uh, revelations around financial crimes and white collar crime are also sort of starting to show things spilling over into multiple sectors and so on. So, so, so the, the, the corruption studies industry has also gotten quite a bit shaken up in the past uh, twenty years, and I don't, I don't say this uh, facetiously. There is indeed uh, you know very large, uh, a significant number of scholars. Who, uh, who work on corruption, and this became more prominent after uh, the uh, UN, there was a UN convention on anti-corruption, and people started looking into you know study commissioning more studies and so on. So, what all this led to, at least in my mind, was the sense that corruption distresses us. It's a it's a sociological category in the sense that it. Uh, it, it resonates with the kinds of terms that Durkheim used and Rousseau used uh, to, to develop, uh, you know, some understanding about collectivities and their anxieties. So terms like anomie, uh, terms, uh, well, I, I'm forgetting all the other uh, French uh, words uh, that are associated with this, uh, but, but it is, it, 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 it has a certain kind of a tragic mode at times, but it really uh, it has this association of, you know, that something rotten in a society that can't fully be explicated is at stake. And, and this began to interest me greatly, even as I'd also been reading some texts about tragedy and the use of tragedy across contexts, across 
a social context was also interesting to me that that uh, you know we don't we don't intend to historicize tragedy not it's of course you know uh, in in uh, uh, in literature it developed into certain types of uh, forms and it had very you know certain rules and so on but you do see that tragic plot uh, across multiple forms of narrative uh, and and uh, I, it, it occurred to me, and, and I, I certainly wasn't alone in this, in thinking like this. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, I had a great deal of help from, uh, like I said, this you know vast uh, uh, number of uh, people, scholars working on corruption, uh, and and these weren't the managerial sort at all. You know, so so Michael Johnston's term syndromes of corruption uh, really started to appeal to me, and it it, it occurred to me that if if as an ontological realist, one could postulate that there are sociological forms, patterns, if you will, right? Uh, these, aren't, these aren't necessarily universal patterns, but they're, they're, they're discernible across different instances in history. Right? Uh, uh, the tragic form is, 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 is discernible across uh, various instances in history. The dynasties, are present, you know, uh, almost across the world, but not everywhere. You know, it's it's just that we hear so much about historical or even prehistoric kings and queens and uh, and dynasties and so on. Uh, we 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 sort of taken it for granted that that's that's something uh, that's a sort of a natural order. And and I I, I doubt there's been uh, that much. I mean, I'm not, not it's not a question of doubt. I, I know there hasn't been that much comparative work until quite recently on dynasties, on empires, and so on. And so this, this, this is a puzzle, right? It's a, why would you not want to uh, pay much closer attention to the conditions, the social, the social conditions that, that promote territorial power? And why is it that the different modes and forms of territorial power happen to be quite limited, happen to be quite repetitive across instances. Uh, and, and, and certainly this is not a question that uh, I have any skills at all to, to explore, but to the extent that corruption became a point of entry into trying to understand these putative uh, sociological universals. Well, yes, I, I will lay it out there. There, are, there, there seem to be uh, some kind, there seems to be some kind of evidence that uh, you can identify uh, uh, sociological in universals, perhaps just like you can identify other ideal types in the natural sciences, um, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, volcanoes or, or something else, right? Uh, so so uh, I'm, I, I'm uh, uh, on speculative realism uh, proposes that we not be so obsessed with, uh, you know, uh, um, that Margaret Archer says we have a kind of a, a sociology has had a kind of a torrid love affair with epistemology, and and I think this this kind of keeps tripping us up when in fact you know ontology and 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 and, and the ontological crises. Uh, that we face, like climate change, like the Anthropocene, you know, various other things, are are very much demanding that social theory uh, uh, and the humanities, you know, sort of bucks up and and and, and changes its stance, right? So, 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 so that's that's a kind of a, it's probably a cop out defense uh, to this question of why would I think about corruption as a as a, uh, as, a, as a as a universal, and what is what is that? actually doing but but I, I would want to stand by that and, and sort of say that there's probably a kind of a, uh, a philosophical defense of taking this kind of speculative uh, realist position where a category like um, uh, uh, corruption can be explored in its multiple historical appearances not as something inevitable not as something inexorable not as something that represents uh, human nature but rather as tendencies that we that seem to reflect the operations of power. And the operations of power in this instance 
uh, I would argue, are around territorial power. So territorial strategies is what connects all of these kinds of uh, uh, elite networks that I've tried to document uh, in, the, in the book from Harappa uh, to the present day. And what, what are territorial strategies? This, this, this concern with, or this, this attempt to develop some kind of rent-seeking strategy around, the, uh, around protection, extraction, and war making. So, uh, so, uh, so, 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 uh, it's basically, you know, uh, local gunda tactics, uh, and uh, uh, that are sort of expanded into a larger spatial networked uh, scale. And so, what interests me also in in Harappa, which I didn't have time to explore in the book, and and, and I'm sure you know people uh, have been already writing about this, was the networked nature of these you know thousand odd cities. Why were those networks important? Okay, so you have these fine uh, uh, urban settlements. Why aren't they just simply self-contained? Well, the networks were important because the agents who traveled through these uh, uh, cities became key elites, key gatekeepers. Uh, they were probably the seal bearers. They were probably the ones who managed trade with Mesopotamia. So we have all this archaeological evidence that points to these uh, uh, these kinds of phenomena, and there's 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 plenty of other work done. Chirin Ratnagar has written a lot uh, on um, on Harappa. Uh, you know, there's a whole uh, there's a host of others who've, who've, who've written as well, uh, and then there's also uh, you know processual archaeology or new archaeology that maintains that you can develop these kinds of interpretations safely or, or, or reliably, uh, even though you don't have any idea of the language of the text. So yeah, even without textual evidence, uh, a, a lot of this material evidence is actually uh, very, very informative. And, and here again, uh, Daniel Miller's work on Harappa was very, very important to me uh, because of the way in which he postulated these different ways in which uh, hierarchy, domination, and power might have operated in Harappa. Right? So, so, so you're quite right, Ananya. You know, inequality, hierarchy, domination, uh, and corruption are connected terms. Uh, but and they, and they do take on different forms. I'm not I'm not too concerned about the historicist critique that each set of Ideas, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, belongs to its context and 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 his and place. Right? I, I I feel that might be a, that, that that sort of uh, discounts the possibility of other modes of repetition, uh, and and in some some instances, particularly. So if you if you take, uh, I mean, Quentin Skinner himself, uh, when he writes about uh, uh, you know the cities uh, uh, in in uh, in northern Italy in the between the 11th and the uh, 16th centuries, uh, he, he argues that you know, there was a kind of a historical memory that was reproducing Republican structures from classical Rome. Uh, that, that, was, you know, that, that was very important. So I, I think, uh, I, I think uh, you know, in terms of, if we talk about continuity in strategy, continuity in, 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 in uh, social forms and so on, we might want to ask the question, where does memory play a, a role? Uh, in, all, in all this collective memory, or, or, or are there other, uh, you know, ways in which these patterns are transmitted? I don't know. I'm just, I'm obviously uh, still speculating here. Uh, so, 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 uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I took down all your notes, or, or all my notes correctly on what you said. Um, I mean, I just want to I just want to uh, you know respond for a second mm -hmm. and, and 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 also have you address you know what what Manu uh, said more specifically um, but I was just thinking that you know you know uh, is corruption like volcanoes <laughs> right I mean is 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 that the order of 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 the of the basic philosophical uh, you know, point that you're trying to make. That's one thing. But the other thing also is, 
that look, in South Asia, we can say very clearly that we had dynasties, you know, at the very beginning, and we seem to still have dynasties, right? So, so there's a lot of continuity in that particular form. But we didn't have democracy, right? We didn't have any idea of equal citizenship. We didn't have a modern Republican form of sovereignty till 1935 or 1947 or 1950. And there is a before and there is an after. And as you know, as, as Shelley Pollock says, I mean, you know, how does newness enter the world, right? I mean, there are emergent phenomena that, that have no precedent, right? Or you could take the Amartya Sen view that actually, you know, there's a deep history of hidden history of democratic tendencies that are already discernible from the very earliest moments of um, the historical record on the Indian subcontinent. But, you know, that's really, I mean, that's, that's like a Skinnerian move in the sense that, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about these, these memories and these habits that, um, that, you know, can be discerned if you really set out to look for them. But, you know, let's face it, India was not democratic till it became democratic, right? So, um, I mean, the question here of continuity is not a small one, and it's not an insignificant one, and you can't really sort of, you know, uh, get over it, I think, uh, without very carefully uh, tackling the historicist problem, which keeps coming up again and again. Um, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't want to hog all the time. So maybe, um, uh, Manu, if you want to say something or... Let me say one or two things, because this is, I mean, this has come up before, obviously, and uh, you know, almost precisely in the same sense, right? Uh, as, you know, this, where does newness begin, right? What's, isn't corruption a new phenomenon? It's only, and uh, Mark Warren has written about this, Mark Philp has, has written about this. You know, this corruption scholars were also asking this question. Is it, is it wrong to use the word corruption role, for instance, right? And, and, uh, uh, and uh, I, I concede that point, and I'm, I'm, I'm simply expanding the term corruption, but not, but not in the sense in which, not in the sense in which one can expand the word democracy. Democracy has occurred only once or twice, right? In, in, in uh, um, you know, uh, before uh, the uh, 1500s. Uh, democracy, or uh, before, before the 1200s, right? The democracy hasn't been uh, a universal phenomenon. And so, but democratic practices or democratic impulses were to some degree present, but, but that's a separate matter. Now, now, coming back to this question of, you know, so, so, so I'm trying to understand two things, uh, Ananya. One is, if you're saying that the, the contemporary understanding of corruption uh, cannot be applied to uh, deep pasts, then I'd agree with you. But if you think about corruption as the operation of cabals and the rottenness that they spawn in different contexts, then you might associate my use of the word corruption more closely with your understanding of, say, inequality or domination or uh, you know, other patterns, other other ways in which. Uh... Well, on the contrary, Jella, I would say that, um, <clears throat> you know, when you when you spoke about, and I remember when you know you used to want to, uh, or you maybe you did even uh, uh, run that reading group on uh, on the Greek uh, on the Greek tragedies and on the on Plato's dialogues. You remember uh, when back when we were in Boston, you would you know you wanted to systematically read these, so so. If you look at the Greek tragedies, or you look at the the, the, the Greek uh, philosophical texts, uh, or you look at the Shakespearean tragedies, even, right, and there you you think about moral moral corruption, right, uh, the canker in the soul, right, something is rotten in the state of Denmark, right, um, or the way in which Greenblatt writes about tyranny, right, and tyrants. Right? Or you, you think about a character like Shylock in The Merchant of Venice. You know, in those contexts, I can understand that we are traveling widely over history and we are talking about certain forms of moral perversion, right? Or the fall from virtue, 
right? Or some kind of sort of non-Christian understanding of sin or stain or, or, or unreliable, untrustworthy behavior, right? All those things I understand it as being covered by either by corruption or by some genealogical, etymological antecedent, you know, of, of, of that idea, right? But, but the more sociological you become, the harder it is for me to, to see that line, you know, continuing through history. Um, and I don't know, Manu, if you have anything to say about this, um, you know, because you, you have all sorts of different examples, you have access to different examples of, of history than either, either Chela or I, I uh, you know. You wanna say something, Manu, are you there? Well, uh, uh I think uh, we are playing the extreme here, you know, and I always on um, such a such uh, occasions uh, would like to try to make the the uh, take the middle uh, ground. Um, Sorry, I can, you can't. We can I can't understand what you're saying. Can you hello? just yeah, a little louder and a little slower. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was saying that uh, perhaps we are here uh, dealing with two extremes. One trying to look for certain forms of uh, trans historical. Hello? We just lost him. Yeah. When I got the first part, one, two extremes, one belonging to trans historical themes. Is that right? Manu? Okay, Jella, I, I mean, let's, you know, we, we don't have, we don't have uh, too much time. So why don't you, uh, why don't you say some, whatever you wanted to say anyway, and then he can come back if he comes yeah. back. So, so let, let, let me actually use this time to, uh, to, to respond to Manu. Uh, because uh, I think there's a related point he made, and he was talking about these very specific uh, conditions of, uh, uh, you know, these uh, warrior peasants, if you will, uh, in uh, different contexts in, in Kerala. I, I don't know if the word peasant applies, but uh, agrarian uh, societies in, uh, uh, in, in so South India, which were uh, sort of which had different modes of protection, uh, but also extraction and so on, right? And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering whether those kinds of terms, you know, Marxist terms, uh, political economy terms are still going to be subject to this historicist challenge, right? Uh, of, of protection, extraction, uh, you know, revenue, uh, 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 collection, rent seeking, and so on. Because if we're going to make arguments about those categories, we should be clear why, why they are problematic, right? Uh, is, it, is it wrong then to say that uh, the forms of rent collection that took place in ancient Egypt had some bearing or had some relation to Akbar's Mansabdari system? Right? Uh, uh, they were certainly not identical. There were vast differences. And again, uh, you know, British forms of uh, British colonial forms of, uh, 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 you know, uh, revenue uh, collection had completely different forms subsequently. So, so as historical ca categories, is it then wrong to use common terms? Uh, that would be my counter argument. Right. So, so it's 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 just that it's it's the the the, the point it, the point of using a word uh, like corruption would simply be to sort of define an ideal type and to sort of trace it in in multiple contexts and see what different patterns or syndromes that ideal type seems to reappear as. And these aren't arbitrary ideal types; they're types that happen to uh, result in some you know consolidation of certain modes of power whether it's sovereign power or other forms of power so 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 i don't know if i'm making sense here but I, i'll stop over there manu are you back i think it looks like you're back yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i'm very okay. much up, 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 please you know you you carry on now so yeah. I, was, uh, I was trying to argue that uh, uh, there is some some uh, some uh, uh, middle ground that one can actually uh, take because there are certain historical forms 
uh, which might continue across time. The instance example that I was giving was that of uh, private property as an institution, the landed property. The nature of land holding itself or the agrarian structure itself might have undergone tremendous changes. We have had land reforms in the 60s and 70s. So all that has affected the, the, the structure of land holding itself. But the idea of private property in land, at least in India, I guess is 2600 years old. Uh, so this form uh, often tends to continue across time, although the manner in which it functions itself uh, might change. Uh, there is no democracy in, say, 1500 or in uh, 1080, but there is a form of power. So as the form, power, of course, uh, has some kind of a trans, trans uh, historical uh, presence. So the, uh, the, I think there is a need to, to uh, you know, uh, bridge these uh, two extremes. Uh, rather than saying that it's all trans historical or that everything has its own history and therefore cannot be uh, read out of context, I think there is there is room to uh, to uh, you know to be on the middle path. I just want to read out some of the uh, the Q and A. Uh, there were some items in the Q and A. Oh. Um, yeah, there's uh, there's Dahlia Wadan. I don't know if it might be a friend of yours, uh, Chela, uh, says, if corruption erodes trust through discursive strategies of the connected cabals, what are the means to restore trust without forming counter cabals? Wouldn't, wouldn't uh, you know, who would also be susceptible to the same strategies of power? Is it a is it a human predicament to counter power by power? <laughs> um, can you can you make it small, please? Uh, yeah. Did you did you get that, Chella? Are you able to see it in the Q and A box? Yes, and I did respond to it. I don't know if I respond if everyone can see my response. Uh, oh not. no. Okay. Oh, there. Oh, I see. You already responded. Okay, okay, but I can I can you you can read it out or I can explain what I said. No, that's, I mean, that's fine. Well, I mean, you can, you can read it out if you like, or if you just want to say something, that's fine too. Yeah, so, so there are anti-corruption strategies at work. And, and I don't know if uh, you had a chance to see that. I mean, I'm sorry about uh, missing the presentation entirely, uh, but uh, the, there, was a, there was a slide there uh, with two networks, if you might uh, remember, two network diagrams. And there's actually uh, material from my um, uh, one of my PhD students uh, who I'm sharing with somebody from an engineering department. <clears throat> can we go to it? We can go to your slide if you yeah, like. Yeah, but I'll, just ex I'll explain what's going on. So, sh so, so I should- Lower down, right? Just the next one after this maybe. No, yeah, this one? Network morphology? Is yeah, that... you might have to share the screen because I can't see. Oh, it. sorry, okay. Um, Huh. Can I will just share it. Hang on. Uh, yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah, exactly. That's the one. And yeah. so Aishwarya Raman, she's been uh, looking at these farmer producer corporations in Tamil Nadu, and she's been looking at different uh, forms, different, you know, different entities. She has a large database of these organizations, and she's been conducting interviews and so on. And so she selected these two, uh, both of which work uh, in sort of natural farming and agroecology and so on. Uh, but the one on the right was started entirely through networks of uh, women as uh, based SSGs and uh, kind of uh, emerged out of, uh, you know, sort of seed sharing and other kinds of uh, practices across villages. So the, each node here represents uh, actually a farmer and they could be uh, in a whole district or even across districts, right? But this one here uh, came out of a traditional, uh, uh, you know, set of farms, farmers rather, uh, who were kind of uh, fed up with, uh, you know, uh, chemical-based agriculture and decided to form this FPO to you know, share their uh, work and, you know, also have better supply chains and so on. But what, what's different here is that you have cabals and you can see that through this kind of morphology, you see some, you know, people controlling uh, access to certain groups. These 
entities are very important and these are called bridging nodes because uh, so if this is if this group of farmers for instance has access to markets or or capital or something else perhaps this group has more access to capital you know getting to them becomes tricky it's sort of bridged through these uh, kinds of uh, um, uh, how should i put it uh, uh, agents right and so so that's the point uh, about cabals that cabals are uh, you know they have this first mover advantage this this actually this this morphology is very interestingly very very similar to the way in which the medici operated the medici uh, became powerful because they were the only ones who had control and access to specific families and groups uh, in and around florence as well as in other cities and and so they became they, and they made sure that the others couldn't and this this is a fantastic work by paget and ansel uh, showing how they kind of systematically prevented others from actually having access to these uh, key uh, uh, nodes. Right? So, so uh, I'm just saying that there's there's something to be learned from these strategies. I don't know exactly what, but uh, uh, so Michael ja Johnston refers to democratization as a counter strategy for corruption, and he says breaking up cabals might be operationalized through such grassroots campaigns that break up these uh, gatekeepers and uh, centralized modes of power. So that's all I have to say on this uh, question. Okay, uh, you know, we, uh, we don't, th there's some, there's some, um, there's some people in the chat, but I don't know what, what that's happened. Somebody suggested Bernard Mandeville, The Fable of the Bees, Private Vices, Public Benefits. I don't know. Um, I'm connecting from Cairo. Oh, that's Dahlia who asked the question. Okay. Um, I, I mean, you know, we're, we're fine for time because it's our, you know, we're all sort of on our own, um, on our own, uh, you know, sort of you know, systems here. Um, I just, uh, I thought maybe you you might um, might develop uh, a little more. Um, you know this question of of, of ontological realism and um, sociological forms, right? I mean, you know, these are questions that, for example, in the study of caste. I mean, this is absolutely a key. Uh, you know, this is a key problem. Uh, this is a key problem, right? Um, that, you know, is caste really something like a social hierarchy that produces social inequality? Or is it is it something more than that? Right? And, and you know, how come how come at some points it looks like racism, but at other points, it looks like it's it's completely unique to this part of the world? Right and and does not map on to other forms of social inequality, hierarchy, differentiation, you know, identity politics that you find in other societies, right? Um, and that's exactly the problem that you know you 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 it, it it's so difficult to arrive at a terminology that makes sense over time, um, you know. And sometimes vo vocabularies and terminologies don't make sense over cultural difference. Right. And, and, and at least here at the center, I mean, we ha we've had, you know, a 60 year conversation about the particularity of South Asian categories or not. Right. Uh, or the particularity of modern categories or not, um, you know, and, 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 and you know, how, how, how can we capture the discourse to make things mean what we want them to mean rather than, you know, what they meant in, 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 in the Greek classics or in, in, in the biblical literature or, you know, in, in uh, enlightenment uh, theory or in, 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 in romanticism or whatever it is, you know, whatever the dominant forms of, of knowledge and epistemology that are available to us. So um, I think, I mean, I think as a sort of uh, exercise, this is, this is so valuable you know, what you've undertaken, um, just to show that it can be done. It can be done, you know, even, even with all these limits in place of untranslatability and so on, it's, it, it still can be done. Um, 
but I wanted to I wanted to return to this question of memory because I you know um, for example I know I mean you probably you know you know you know your Ranajit Guha I'm sure you know for example so he talks about um, you know uh, it, you know why certain kinds of subordination and subalternity uh, you know arise in the colonial period right because he you know he argues in a sense and I'm just being very reductionist here but that that you know uh, uh, bhakti or this attitude of sort of devotion devotion and surrender right and putting yourself at a lower position than some some object of of adoration of devotion of obedience right that accounts for right and a culturally dispersed attitude of bhakti in a sense accounts for the fact that we end up being colonized and we end up being dominated right and we end up in a subaltern position right he's trying to he's trying to sort of push it back in history as a kind of cultural tendency that's already present and that you can see in various texts and and, 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 and you know in, in in you know in all kinds of whatever whatever your form of evidence you know you can find it there um but at the same time you have something like and I've, you know, I've said this many times. I mean, the, you know, what you see uh, by way of a theory of sovereignty um, uh, and and a form of of, of ethical, uh, social, and political life in the Ashokan edicts, right? Now, that is actually not available to us. That is lost to our historical memory. There is a long you know, 2000 year period of complete amnesia as far as, as far as Ashoka is concerned, till they, you know, till, till the British arrive and we start look, looking at these, uh, uh, at these pillars and these, uh, you know, rock edicts and, and, and connecting them to each other, connecting them back to this historical figure, to this period in, in history and so on. All of that is, is, is lost, isn't it? It's not there. It's not available, you know, whether to Akbar or to Babur or to, you know, uh, Chandragupta Maurya or, you know, I mean, it's an, it is available to Chandragupta Maurya, but it's not available maybe to, to, to you know, any of the Guptas or any of the, the Southern, uh, you know, potentates or any of the Islamic kings. I mean, what, where did that go? And if we today claim that certain forms of nonviolence are, are sort of part of our cultural repertoire and our, you know, that they're, they're just fundamental to the South Asian way of, of uh, you know, uh, of, 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 of human life, right? Then, you know, what kinds of slates of hand are involved there in, in, in projecting mis in at least in this particular form? um you know for for centuries um you know the ashokan dhamma it's missing it's it, it, we've, we've lost it we've forgotten it similarly these undeciphered uh you know seals and so on in 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 the in the indus valley actually there may be concepts there that we just don't even know what they are because we can't we can't read it and they might be entirely different than anything we have ever encountered. Uh, those, are, those are big questions, obviously. Uh, I just want to take refuge in two things. One is something that Manu said about these different uh, uh, extremes of historical categories, some that have, that, that seem to be repeatable or repetitive, across a variety of contexts. And one of them, I think, is this quest for territory. So territorialization is a, is a fairly recent, I mean, it's only a historical phenomenon. I mean, uh, barely since uh, the Chakotic uh, age. Uh, so, uh, so what does that tell us? You know, that territory and these, these attempts to control territory, uh, uh, what do they produce? They produce to my mind uh, and to several others, I, I think, uh, uh, a tendency towards accumulation. And that tendency towards accumulation, you know, seems to have certain logics. And it's those logics that I'm really interested uh, in sort of 
trying to follow. So, so, and, and so then, then that brings me to the next point, you know, what kind of category is a word like social category is a word like corruption. And uh, here I take refuge in Robert Elias uh, and his idea of figuration, right? So, so uh, a sociological fact is not a thing, but a performance and a sort of an interaction between conditions of life and ways of living. And those operate within very particular material contexts. Uh, and so uh, in a sense, what happened in ancient Rome was a certain kind of figuration that worked extremely well to, to serve certain territorial strategies, which sort of reproduced a set of cabals and their you know, enablers and a whole society and culture were built up through that. And as uh, you know, Foucault would have it very conveniently, you know, discursive apparatuses were produced and, 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 and generated and, and had their own uh, modes of operation and transformation and so on. So I, th I think that, that kind of understanding of corruption uh, then for me is this, is this betrayal through this, through, because the alternative is to not be dominated. So, so the, 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 the alternative is to not, you know, expend unusual, extraordinary levels of labor, either as a slave or as a, uh, you know, a subject in a, of a patriarchal society and so on to, to sort of keep this, this system, this culture operating. Uh, and, 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 and we have those alternatives in the work of people like uh, James C. Scott, who talks about pre-agrarian societies, pre-grain societies in particular, and, uh, and what those uh, amount to and how this was really a kind of an entrapment of people into territorial landscapes. So, I, 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 so I'm wondering whether that sort of helps to bridge this gap. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if I've lost you, but... Uh, You're back now. We okay. lost you just briefly. Oh, you were yeah. saying about, um, you said about Foucault's discursive strategies and then uh, discursive apparatuses. Then you, yeah, you were, you were talking about James Scott. Yeah. Lost you, yeah. And uh, uh, so, so uh, I'm just saying that that narrative, that way of thinking about corruption as a figuration, mm -hmm. as a, rather than as a, as, as, as a, as an object or as a, you know something an attribute uh, i think would be uh, you know closer to my reading here and the reason i use the word corruption is because it is a corrupting it's a it's a process of you know uh, uh, getting people to conform to certain ways of living by creating those conditions of life that make it so they can't escape those ways of living I mean, I, I, I think this way because I, I wrote my dissertation, my PhD dissertation in Los Angeles on automobility. You know, everybody's entrapped into the, into the automobile. And so I think <laughs> that's a, uh, and, and, and Elias has a you know, wonderful way of describing those kinds of conditions. Manu, do you want to, uh, do you want to come in or does anybody else uh, among our attendees, participants, Anybody wants to say something, please raise your hand or say something in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Everyone must be tired. Ananya. Well, um, um, no, it's also, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's very diverse. We don't actually know who's out there because so many people might be watching on Facebook or something. Um, I don't know, Chella, if you know what that is. <laughs> But Manu, if you wanted to have any last words, and then maybe we can close. Uh, we've been here for quite a while. Well, I think I agree with the, the last point that Tella made about uh, territoriality uh, having this particular uh, uh, context of accumulation. Uh, because uh, the last chapter in the book that you have on the table out there uh, actually speaks about uh, one such territory in India, that's the, that's the territory of Pakalinga. So I'll try to, uh, to, uh, to understand how the idea of the territory itself, Kalinga, emerged. And there's a very close connection between what Chella would call elite formation 
and uh, and the, the spread of an agrarian economy, but more importantly, uh, the the rise of uh, private holdings and land. So this connection is very clear. The the, the connection between uh, maximization in terms of agrarian resources and elite formation is a very very key, a very uh, what do you call uh, a consistent pattern that you see uh, for at least six hundred years in the case that I have studied that. So I think I quite agree with him on the point of uh, territorialization. Uh, having connections with uh, with, uh, with maximization strategy. This is something that uh, you know Ashish Nandi brings up at every at every opportunity that you know there's a difference between nationalism and patriotism. Um, that some sort of love of or attachment to where you are spatially um, uh, is is. Uh, Chella, is, 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 are, are you in pain? Are you sort of in pain? Is that what's happening? I just realized that I, I should be getting up every now and then. And, and moving, and, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll let back you surgery. So. Um, no, but I mean, I, I was just saying that we, you know, we talk about this a lot, that, that there are forms of, and, and he often mentions birds and animals in this context, that, you know, an attachment to your place, your locus, of, of life, uh, some idea of home uh, precedes the nation and maybe more fundamental to species being as such um, than, than constructs and, and, and you know, superstructural categories like, like nation and state and so on. Um, and I wonder if you're, you're sort of also trying to get down to that level of, uh, you know, of, of, of analysis. Um, uh, the it actually reminds me of a line from uh, Marquez's uh, famous book, you know, 100 Years of Solitude. He says there is no belonging to any place unless there is someone buried there. What, what's that you're talking about? Marquez? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What, what about him? No, he has a famous line in this uh, first book, 100 Years of Solitude, where he says I that you don't I... belong to any place unless there is someone buried there. And an en en entropy of, <laughs> of the internet here. We're, we're just sort of, you know, um, it's sort of devolving into um, into uh, silence. So um, maybe we'll maybe we'll just call it uh, call it a day, Chella. In any case, you're not in any shape to to uh, you know to be carrying on a two-hour seminar. So um, maybe we can close today. I would invite anybody who's out there listening or who will listen in the future. Uh, you can write to Sudhir Chalarajan at uh, the um, IIT Madras. You will find him on the humanities and social sciences uh, you know, webpage. And uh, similarly, Manu Devadevan, uh, who is at the IIT Mandi, they're all very easily found on the internet. And if you have, you know, detailed questions or comments, uh, you can always write to um, both these scholars. So thank you so much for, uh, for, for being with us today, Chela, especially given difficult circumstances you're in. Thanks, Manu, you too. I know you have no electricity. Um, and just as the electricity is coming back, we're, we're, uh, we're ending our, um, our panel. Um, but thank you. Thanks, Chela, and congratulations on this wonderful new book. Thanks. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. And inviting me. Getting this together somehow. <laughs>